All right. Welcome again uh, to Open Education Week 2014. This is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium at the Open Courseware Consortium. And uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, we have some um, amazing community college OER innovations uh, to tell you about. And um, I have uh, three uh, very, uh, very talented folks who are going to join us here. Uh, Cynthia Alexander from Cerritos College, Natalie Cool from Northern Virginia Community College, and Paul Golish from the Maricopa Community College District who will each be uh, taking their turn to tell you about uh, what they are doing um, to promote OER in their colleges and districts. Um, very briefly, we are using the California Community College system, uh, uh, Blackboard Collaborate uh, today, and we want to thank them for that. And on the left-hand side of your screen, you should see a uh, chat window, um, and underneath that, uh, participants list. And you should see yourself in that participants list, hopefully. And uh, during the webinar, we're going to ask that you put your comments and questions uh, in our chat window, and we'll do our best to answer those. Um, but we'll also have some time at the end um, to get to those questions. And, um, our order uh, today is going to be, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about OER for some of you who may be new to this or, um, or, or want a refresher. And uh, then we're going to hear from NOVA, uh, the NOVA project, which is Northern Virginia's uh, OER-based general education program. We're going to hear about the Kaleidoscope OER project at Cerritos. And finally, we'll hear from the Maricopa College District OER project co-director. Um, And um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with um, a little bit um, of the uh, kind of nuts and bolts of um, open educational resources. So the U.S. Department of Education defines these as teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use or repurposing by others. And as, as some of you may know, the Department of Education and the Department of Labor have um, collaborated together on a series of grants called the TACT grants, which are supporting um, uh, career training uh, curriculum, which is required to be openly licensed. And so this has been a huge um, infusion of funding for supporting the development of OER. And um, if any of you are participating in those at your um, colleges or, um, or districts, uh, please type that in the, in the chat window and, and let us know a little bit about your projects. So we talk about an open license, and this is what uh, really distinguishes these educational resources and makes it possible for their reuse. And uh, we use the Creative Commons um, open license, which is the standard these days. Um, and what, as a, what it provides um, as an, someone who is developing the curriculum, they retain the full rights of copyright, but when they put a Creative Commons license on it, they release a version which um, allows others to reuse it um, and remix it and redistribute it. So you're not giving it away, but you're making a version available for reuse, revision, and remixing. So it's a very powerful way for us to share um, open educational materials. And the examples of what an OER um, is, is quite wide. It could be an open textbook. It could be an open course. It can be open videos online, such as the Khan Academy or just videos on YouTube uh, which have an open license, and more and more videos do. But truly, it's any tool, material, or technique that can be used to support ready access to knowledge. And we at the Community College Consortium uh, for OER, um, our, our mission is promoting adoption of OER to enhance teaching and learning. And um, one of our really big goals is expanding access to education for students. And so finding uh, materials that are adoptable by faculty um, to make college more affordable. And we do this uh, through professional development and other collaboration opportunities. 
these webinars that we offer on a monthly basis. Today, of course, we're offering three of them on one day because of Open Ed Week, but they're all about giving faculty support around uh, finding and adopting and adapting resources um, to use in their classrooms. And ours is a voice for open education at community colleges. Um, and that, that is our focus, but we work quite a bit with four-year uh, colleges and universities because many of our students become your students at the, at the four years, and um, it's quite important that we, that we work together and we have many similar um, uh, goals in mind. And we um, have over 240 colleges that participate with us in 16 states and provinces. We actually have um, uh, British Columbia is also part of our consortium, but all of our activities online are open uh, to um, colleges and educators who are interested, um, and we do not charge fees for those. Excuse me there. And without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Natalie Kluhl. She is the librarian at the Extended Learning Institute at Northern Virginia Community College. And over the last year, uh, Northern Virginia Community College has rolled out an OER-based general education program. And Natalie is going to tell us about uh, the really team-based process uh, that was involved uh, to roll out this successful project. Natalie? Thanks, Una, and thanks everybody for coming out today and um, learning a little bit more about our projects. Uh, as Una said, my name is Natalie Kluhl. Um, I'm the librarian for the Extended Learning Institute at NOVA, and the Extended Learning Institute is just the online department, so we service all the online courses, develop online courses, and support online students. Um, so as Una said, I'm going to talk about sort of a teamwork approach that we take at NOVA in developing um, open educational resource-based courses. Um, so in 2013, uh, so just last year, we received a grant to develop and offer 12 OER general education courses. And the goal in that was to create a general education certificate track that was solely based on OERs so that we could lower the cost of um, you know, students attending college, which is something obviously that we're all concerned about. So the way that that worked was uh, we put forth for a grant from the Virginia Community College system, were awarded that grant, and then we went through a process of developing um, these 12 courses that are all based um, on OERs. And so students don't have to take all 12 courses. They could opt in um, to just a few, or if all 12 fell into their interest, they could take all 12 and wind up um, with a general education certificate out of that. So this year, um, we reapplied for the grant and was, again, rewarded um, or awarded the grant to develop an additional 10 OER general education courses. So we've just started that process. We actually had a meeting um, with our faculty last week that are going to be helping us with the 10 OER courses. Now, all of these courses, um, or most of these courses, are courses that we had previously developed, um, had used traditional textbooks, um, used a lot of traditional education um, resources, course packets and, and all different things. Um, and so what we are doing is taking those courses and uh, creating an OER version of those. And in the process, what it's allowed us to do is, is create a greater awareness of OER at NOVA. So we've had faculty that are very familiar with OER and very passionate about it. And we also have faculty that maybe weren't as familiar with the concept but signed on and agreed to help us with this project. So when I think about OER, th this quote really stood out to me by Helen Keller, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. One of the, the beautiful things really about the OER movement is that it's not about um, creating something just at your particular college to support your students. What you create can be shared and reused and remixed using that Creative Commons license. And really together, our opportunities to impact students are far greater than what we can do by ourselves. And this is sort of um, 
the mantra that that we have at Eli that we really take this team-based approach in doing this so that we can provide support to our students and our faculty, um, you know, and everybody involved in the process. So this is our OER team. This is just kind of a visual of, of the way we work. Uh, so we have faculty, instructional designers, uh, library staff, and administration, and we all come together in this process of developing these courses. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what each member does in, in creating these courses, and then tell you a little bit more at the end about our project and the way it's kind of all come together. So the faculty are our subject matter experts. They're the ones that they know their content. They, um, they teach it. Typically, and I think actually in all cases, our faculty had already taught these courses um, in a more traditional way. And they were helping us convert it to OER. Um, so we rely on them for that subject matter expertise and that knowledge um, of the content. And in doing that, they evaluate the OERs for quality or appropriateness. We don't dictate what OERs faculty can use. Um, you know, it's really based on their student learning outcomes, the objectives for their course, and what they see to be a good fit. And that's something that we really, um, you know, encourage them to evaluate these resources and, and choose what works best for their courses. And then, of course, they always make the final decision on their course content. Again, because they are the experts, um, they really are sort of the drivers behind this whole process. We also have a great group of instructional designers that really work hard to support our faculty. Um, they do it in traditional design, but they're also equally passionate about doing it with OER. So they're the course design experts. Um, they understand how curriculum comes together in an online environment to um, help students learn and reach those outcomes and objectives that we've set for the course. Uh, again, like I said, a lot of these courses we are converting from where they had used more traditional resources into the OER resource. And when you do that, um, especially if you had a course that really uh, was a very heavy user of a traditional textbook, there's a lot of other things that we had to consider when we were converting to OER. Um, if they used the course codes that are very popular these days and that sort of thing, a lot of times there were assignments and exam questions and study aids that came along with that. And so when you get away from that traditional textbook model and convert over to OER, um, we had to kind of come up with different ways to address that. And the instructional designers are really instrumental in encouraging faculty to consider new learning activities or maybe take learning activities that they were familiar with and changing them a little bit to, to meet the new design. And they've been really great um, about supporting the faculty in doing that. And then our instructional designers are also um, in charge of ensuring our course quality. So it doesn't matter whether a student is taking a traditional course or an OER course, the course quality has to remain the same. And our instructional designers um, are the ones that go through and make sure um, you know, that all of our objectives and our assignments are aligned with our objectives. And and all of those things, the, the instructions are clear to students, and we're maintaining our um, ADA compliance and, and things of that nature. So our instructional designers are really instrumental in providing that support to faculty to make sure that they're able to address um, all of those issues. As a librarian, what I do is I am an information expert. So I work with faculty to identify open educational resources. One of the things that we realized is that when faculty, especially ones who maybe aren't as familiar with OERs, start exploring it, there's so much out there. And they're surprised by that, right? But that, that's a good thing. And it's also a scary thing for them at the same time. Um, so what we, what I do is help narrow their focus, um, take away some of the overwhelming um, aspects of doing this search, and help them focus on their particular discipline. So I, I identify OERs in their discipline just to let them know what's available. And we also do a lot of a targeted searching. So they know that they you know, want something on a particular topic, or maybe in a, in a specific format, like a video, or a book, or an um, article, or something like that. Um, and I can help you know, track some of that stuff down and give them options to choose from. I also work with them on copyright and Creative Commons guidance. Again, um, for those that weren't as familiar with OER, they aren't always as familiar with Creative Commons, and so kind of guiding them and what that means, um, you know, their ability to go in and change and remix and, and 
you know, if they just want to use um, a particular chapter or a paragraph or a page, um, or maybe they want to adapt it specifically to their course content, kind of guiding them in how they can do that. Um, and if they find more things that maybe don't necessarily have the Creative Commons license on them, kind of talking to them about copyright and how that fits into the course and um, making sure, you know, that because this is going to be shared, that they're aware of, of different copyright laws and things of that nature. And then, of course, we have our administration, and, and they're, they're very critical to what we do. They're the organization, that organization experts. They're the ones that go out and get the funding for us um, through the grants to allow us to do what we do. Um, and, and they pull all the pieces together. And so my supervisor is Dr. Preston Davis. He's the Director of Instructional Services. Um, and he was really the one to go out and get the grant. And he is the one that organizes meetings, um, brings us all together, gets the faculty on board, makes sure that we're all on the same page, and, and everything of that nature. And so without that administrative support, we would not be nearly as um, successful. We probably wouldn't be able to convert as many or create as many classes um, as we've been able to do in the last two years. So bringing it all together and a little bit more specific about how this applies to our project, um, the way our project works is we have an introductory meeting. And so for 2014, we just had our meeting last week with our faculty. And that's an informational meeting. It gets faculty um, familiar with the project and, and how we're going forward with this. And everybody's at the meeting, faculty, um, administration, myself, instructional designers. And, and it's, it's an informal opportunity to sit down and talk about the project and where we see it going um, so that faculty can kind of feel it out and decide if it's a good fit for them. Um, we also then start having meetings. The instructional designers start meeting with the faculty to talk about um, how they see their course being designed. And I start having meetings with faculty to talk about where we can find um, open educational resources for them. Um, I start, you know, showing them websites and, and, and places they can go to find that information. And a lot of times we all work together. This picture is actually um, a faculty member of ours in the white shirt sitting at the computer. Uh, Will Hathaway, he teaches English, and he converted one of our English courses for us last year. And then um, standing behind him is one of our instructional designers, Jason Skinner, and then myself. And you know, it's a lot of these small meetings and, and regular meetings to kind of talk through the process and, and help identify those resources. We also keep a um, Blackboard site up for, like, a, it would be like a course site, but just the faculty that are involved in the project are enrolled. And this is a great way to kind of disperse information to them, um, gives them a chance to explore open resources. I can post stuff in there. There's a discussion board so they can communicate amongst each other. So that way they all realize, you know, they're not alone in this project. There are people there to support them. Um, and then we just work on this for several months in this model of teamwork um, until we develop our courses. So this is the results from last year's, um, from the 12 classes that we developed last year. You can see in the left-hand corner, those are the courses that we converted to OER. In the case of History 262 down here, this was a brand new um, course, and we just developed it on an OER model from the beginning. This gives you also a sense of the cost of the materials. So for a student, how much they would have to pay, pay for course materials um, before the redesign to OER. And then in the right-hand column, we've got the potential fall 13 savings. So we're still pulling together our final data from the fall. The very last box in the bottom right-hand corner shows the potential savings. What I can say is we did save students over $200,000 just by converting those courses. Um, most of those courses didn't run towards until towards the end of fall. We are offering all of those courses again and many more sections. Um, this spring, and so we, those numbers are just going to go up. This is just, you know, really a drop in the bucket of, of the direction that we're going. And then, of course, this year we're developing 10 additional courses. Um, so there's just, you know, the savings for our students are pretty substantial. So 
that's the way the ELI and the NOVA project works in, in sort of a team-based approach and a perspective of how we work together. Um, and so I'll be happy to take any questions. I see you guys are posting some stuff down here in the discussion or in the chat board. Um, are the faculty participants given a stipend? Yes, our faculty are paid a stipend. I, I couldn't tell you how much because I really don't know, but um, they are given a stipend because they're doing this in addition to what would be their traditional um, classroom teaching and other responsibilities they have at the college. Um, yeah, and Paige, as Una said, Eli is the Extended Learning Institute, so we're the online department um, for the community college. We call ourselves Eli. Um, you know, that's just what we go by. So, does anyone else have other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, Natalie. And we'll have more time for um, questions at the end as well. So um, <laughs> hold those questions till um, till we get through our other presenters as well. Thank you. All right. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Cynthia Alexander, who is um, an educational technology professor. She's the department chair there, and she's also co the coordinator for uh, distance learning at Cerritos College. And she's going to tell us about the Kaleidoscope OER project at Cerritos College. Cynthia? Hi. Um, thank you, Una, and thank you all for joining us. Um, Cerritos College has been involved with OER, Open Educational Resources, since 2009. Uh, two years ago, I was asked to become involved with an OER project, and it was kind of in an ancillary position. I was just kind of included. Um, but it had started a year earlier, and it was called Project Kaleidoscope. Um, it's a grant-funded project, and the goal was to implement a set of fully open general education courses uh, using collaboration between a number of schools across the nation. And um, there were two phases. Well, there was a complete phase at the time I uh, joined. And then uh, last year, um, I was asked if I would be uh, working in phase three to actually develop a course. So there are some specific uh, goals for the Kaleidoscope project for the courses, and those are that the courses can only use OER as required course materials. Um, uh, it had to, the courses have to include collaboration from multiple institutions, and there had to be sufficient ass assessment at the end of the learning outcomes to allow for ongoing um, evaluation. I went to click my space bar. That's not going to work. OK. All right. Um, so um, the course that I was asked to collaborate on it was a course called Introduction to Online Learning. And it's something that I've been teaching for a number of years here at Cerritos College. Uh, the people that I collaborated with were, were Spokane Community College in Washington State, Central Community College in Nebraska, and Mercy College, which is a four-year college in New York. Um, Cerritos College, is, um, as I have on the slide, is in uh, California. So the first thing we did is we met at a workshop in Park City, Utah, and that was conducted immediately after the Open Ed Conference uh, last November. Uh, the second day of the workshop was used totally as a planning day, and we were to uh, determine how we were going to divvy up our work and what we were going to um, literally be working on. So what we did is um, during that time, we compared our student learning outcomes, you can imagine, with um, uh, four colleges. We had essentially four sets of student learning outcomes, slows. And uh, so we um, compared them. And uh, for anything that was similar, we kind of reworded them so that they were the same. And then we left all of them in. We wanted to make sure that every, every uh, student learning outcome was addressed in some way. Uh, then we next determined what kind of content we were going to, do, to use in the course. We assigned tasks, who was going to do what. And we created a timeline. So all documents uh, were shared in Google Docs. And the course was to be finalized in Canvas. I will just say that um, 
one of our members uses Canvas and she got um, real active in through everything in the Canvas, which has been a little bit of a problem for some of us to go in and, and make some uh, changes, but that's only because we're not familiar with Canvas. Uh, uh, Cerritos uses um, uh, Sakai, uh, Mercy College uses Moodle, um, and um, I think Blackboard is used at uh, Central Community College. So it was quite a little bit of a difference. Okay, so as I said, all student learning outcomes, the slows were addressed for all of us. Um, the content is being set up, it's modular. So um, everything is uh, slow specific so that we make sure that every student learning outcome is addressed. Um, the same thing is with the activities and the assessments for each uh, module. We, um, um, they're all specific to at least one, if not many, um, student learning outcomes. Um, the reason for this is so that anybody who takes this course, remember when it's completed and after it's been piloted, it's going to be um, offered to anybody. It's OER. So um, we assume with four colleges and all of our student learning outcomes that people will come in and look at the course and be able to take the content that pertains to their school's student learning outcomes and um, again in the activities and assessment. So that it's going to be a pick and choose from the course so that you can take uh, what it is you want for your school. Okay, the completion timeline for our uh, phase, for phase three, is the middle to the end of the summer. Uh, we were asked to um, be sure to pilot it by next fall. We were also all asked to pilot, pilot at least two sections. And then we're supposed to go in and examine and evaluate the success, um, or if it's not totally successful, just examine what um, kind of outcomes we did have. They do want us to compare this with the same course that had been taught at our various colleges so that um, we could compare them with uh, uh, if they were more successful than our previous courses had been. Uh, the courses are supposed to be totally ready to be um, uh, available to the public by the end of spring 2015. So um, I've got two courses scheduled back-to-back uh, -back in the fall session um, as nine-week courses. Okay, um, what I wanted to talk about is my experience. I was just blown away. It was um, my experience with working with other faculty. Uh, even though I'm not a person who believes in a lot of collaboration, I, I, I don't care for collaboration sometimes, but this has been extremely rewarding. Uh, there's things that I thought my class was very good at, and I thought, uh, oh, I'm not, I don't think I'm really going to get a lot from these others, uh, the other participants, but boy, what? I was so wrong. The ideas that some of them have, um, uh, Mercy College for uh, converting uh, PowerPoints into movies and just doing all sorts of, of different things that had never even occurred to me has been just fantastic. Um, I, uh, and, and they're not the only ones. Uh, Paula has great ideas. Peggy has great ideas. Everybody has had fantastic ideas, and um, it's been interesting to use exclusively Creative Commons materials. It's, it, that's been fantastic to explore them and uh, pull in things. Uh, Lumen Learning uh, is organizing and is behind the, the information gathering and actually putting everything up. Um, and they're the ones that have been doing a sort of what um, um, uh, information uh, literacy uh, checks, uh, the uh, Creative Commons checks, uh, copyright checks, that sort of thing. They've been handling it. 
Um, so uh, that's been wonderful because I haven't had to do that. Um, and so I, I just wanted to say that Kaleidoscope is actually um, still open for other colleges that want to get involved. And, um, and uh, I, I recommend to anybody, and I do this on campus, I recommend it to you, that um, you do get involved in an OER project. Um, I've just really learned so much. Does anybody have any questions? Um, thank you, Cynthia. Um, great presentation, and uh, you know I had to uh, say uh, I, I loved your your um, proclamation that uh, it's been such a positive experience for you. It looks like you did get a, one or two quick questions, um, which we'll let you answer um, before we go on to Paul. Okay, just a moment. I'm looking back. Uh, da, 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 um, fully collaboration. Oh, yours. Uh, They're Have you developed any courses for social work? Mm, I don't know. The um, list, um, I have the list for phase three, and let me look. Uh, we do have sociology is being worked on right now. Uh, there are, um, uh, I believe, right now they're up to about uh, 60 courses that have either been completed or are still being worked on. But I know sociology is in the group that we're working on now. And then how much time should you give a faculty to convert a traditional course to OER? Gee, how much time? Um, you know, I've been working on all of my courses at Cerritos turning them, changing them um, to OER. Uh, seriously, about uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, uh, after meeting Una, actually, and um, uh, Cable Green at a conference, I came back and I dumped all text for all of the educational technology courses. I got permission from the people that I needed to get permission from, and I did. So I went to using internet resources, which are not necessarily OER. Um, educational technology is very hard to find textbooks that pertain to just that area. But um, to go in and do a really good conversion, I don't know. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Um, Natalie, can you add in on that one? The other thing I might add, this is Una, um, no, I, I'll let Natalie say something, but it's really going to depend on your discipline, Duralia, yeah. and, um, and also um, I think if there's existing open resources out there that can be very easily adapted, um, it will go much quicker. So those are some of the things. Um, and Natalie, if you want to say something quickly, uh, please do. Um, and then we're going to move on to Paul. Just to confirm what they said, it really depends on the course, whether you're developing it from the ground up or whether this is sort of more of a conversion. I will say that for most of our courses, uh, we give them, we, we do about three to four months, but they also have a lot of support. Um, and then, you know, there, but there's always editing and things like that going on as well. Hard. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. And um, I'm putting my email ad address in here, unitydaily at uh, ocwconsortium.org, and I'm happy to answer questions later on um, that occur to people around these. Um, and I, uh, uh, as the outreach director at the Community College Consortium, I'm often a matchmaker where I um, put you in contact with um, folks who have done this before and can really share their expertise. So. At this point, um, I'd like to um, move on to um, our third presenter here, which is Paul Golish, who is the Dean of Information Technology at uh, Paradise Valley Community College. He's also an adjunct math instructor there, and he's the co-chair of the District OER Committee um, within the Maricopa Community College District, which is, I think, the largest community college district in the states uh, with 10 colleges. And, um, Paul, uh, take it away. 
Thanks. And, uh, um, yeah, we are. Well, we're definitely the largest in the state of Arizona, but we're also uh, one of the largest in the country. And uh, good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we are ten colleges. I'm at Paradise Valley, which is one of the ten in the Phoenix area. And uh, for the last several years, we've had faculty in various content areas throughout our district um, using OER. And we call it kind of pockets of innovation. And since we're such a big district with 10 colleges and a couple hundred thousand students, we thought it really would make sense to scale this up. So a little background first before we jump into how we've been doing that. Um, in the summer of 2011, I started using OER um, using Khan Academy videos and um, exercises. And my boss, the president of our college, had encouraged me to really get this going. So I thought, here I am, this pioneer, until I reached out to some of my colleagues across the district and found out they're a couple years ahead of me. So they had been doing great work. I just wasn't aware of it. And so part of the, the struggle, I think, in scaling up and, and adoption of OER is getting that word out. And that's where CCC OER is so great. And, and events like this, the Open Education Week, are so helpful to get that information out there. Because everybody wants to share what they're doing and they want to see other people adopt it, revise it, remix it. So one of the people I reached out to is um, James Souza over at Phoenix College. And I'm just going to throw in a URL in the chat window, um, mathispowerforyou.com that James uh, posts information to. He's done about, I think at this point, 3,500 uh, math videos on uh, YouTube and on that site. And he's just about to hit 12 million views uh, for his videos. So he's uh, really providing some great uh, resources for those across the country and the world. Um, also, when I met with James, he showed me some of the, the excellent things. Um, well, before I go away from this slide, I wanted to show you that one of the things we do is this is actually the cover of my laptop. Uh, so anytime I'm out and about, trying to advertise and communicate because of that importance about sharing that message. So that's, that's what that is. But one of the things James did is connected me with the, the great work that the folks over at Scottsdale Community College have done. And uh, I'll give you a shameless plug for Donna Gaudet. And uh, she is going to, with Quill, Wells, Quill West, uh, do a, a webinar right after this one and how they scaled up um, use of OER in their department. And basically, that almost their entire department is using OER. So really fantastic story uh, going on at Scottsdale. And they've saved their students over $260,000 just in one department at one college in one year. But I don't want to steal too much of Donna's thunder, so I will move on. Um, as I mentioned, James is over at Phoenix College. And so we, we talked with one of his students, uh, Manny, and I um, asked Manny to give us some quotes. And he mentioned not, not just is it great to have the savings because money is so tight for so many students, but, but also the access to be, ha be able to have all students have access to all materials for that class on day one. Um, because many students aren't able to get that. And even if they're not in tough financial situation, many students wait to determine do I really, is it really going to be worth my uh, money to spend on this textbook? Maybe I can do all right without it. Even my own kids, I've got two in college, and they do the same thing. We fight with them all the time. No, you need to get your textbooks. Uh, but, but what happened here with Manny is he says, I, I know that I'm going to have my materials right away on day one. And sometimes, and I do this myself when I'm teaching the course, is send out the access to the materials a couple weeks in advance and certainly leave access to the materials long after the course is over so they can use it for review as they move along into other classes. Uh, here's an example. And again, Donna will show more of this uh, later. But uh, the course I'm using, we, we use a version of Math OES, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Math AS, which is a version of MyOpenMath. But anybody could just go to MyOpenMath.com and request an account. And you could use this free program. So I want to give a shout out to David Lippman um, from, from the state of Washington. He's at Pierce College, although uh, he's working with Lumen Learning currently. And he uh, developed something that's similar to um, 
my math lab or WebAssign, and it's an online uh, homework and assessment program. Has all the basically all the bells and whistles uh, that those other programs have. And James' videos, as you see in the screenshot, there are tied into those. So anytime you've got uh, a question, uh, there's a video that goes along with it. There are video lessons that are a little bit longer. You can see this one's about three and a half minutes. The video lessons that explain kind of why we are learning this lesson are a little bit longer. They're six to ten minutes long. But again, Don is going to show you more about that at uh, the top of the hour, so I will leave that to her. So let's talk about how we scaled up at Maricopa or how we are in the process of that. We, uh, myself and my, and my colleague, my co-chair Lisa Young from Scottsdale Community College met with our provost and executive vice chancellor who is basically our number two person in our entire uh, district, works directly with the chancellor, and uh, presented her with this opportunity. We said we think we can scale up the usage of open educational resources, but we um, we're going to need some help, and we'd like to put together a committee. So she helped us and said, "You really should put presidents on that committee." And we thought our presidents of colleges are really going to want to be on our committee, but but they are. We have two uh, college presidents that are very involved with the committee. They attend regularly. We've got nine faculty from across the uh, colleges. We've got vice presidents, deans, instructional designers, and library faculty. Um, our Maricopa Center for Learning. Uh, Institute also and, and some IT folks. So we've really got a nice diverse group and they helped us uh, put together a, a strategic plan. I'm not a big committee guy. didn't get real excited about having to form a committee, but they've been so enthusiastic and participative. It has really been great. And uh, as we talked about earlier, it's, it's much better. It's a lot more fun when you're collaborating with others and you get a much better product. So very happy with this committee and uh, their participation. In fact, uh, we have, and I'm going to talk about grants in a second, internal grants that, that we offer for development, but members of our committee serve as reviewers of those grants. So Lisa and I can kind of step aside and let others uh, review those. So the four R's of OER, you probably heard these before, revise, reuse, remix, and redistribute. What we try to do when we get others to adopt courses is we said don't recreate it from scratch. Use all the great work that we've been hearing about here in the earlier uh, speakers and uh, across the country and across our uh, district. So we try and get people to, to do that. And that's actually been one of my challenges is I meet with people and they want to do so much of putting their own spin on it that they really um, create a lot of additional work that may or may not be necessary. I was very excited to meet with an adjunct instructor yesterday who said, you know what, the first time I teach this course this summer, I'm not going to make many changes. I'm just going to use it as is, and then once I learn what I want to change, then I'll make those changes. And I wish some more would do that because I think that would help uh, speed up our adoption. But uh, right now we, we just help people um, adapt it in whatever way that they feel uh, they will be comfortable with and that will be successful for the students. All right, another thing that we're doing to create awareness and, and increase the adoption, as I showed you, you know, I've got that uh, skin that I put on my laptop that's out there. We hand out pens to uh, folks that attend our presentations, and it's got the Maricopa Millions and the, the URL to the project, maricopa.edu slash OER. We put that out there as much as we can. We try and carry around that water bottle, and we give those out, just trying to get people talking about it. Uh, we give tons and tons of presentations. Uh, we go to department meetings, um, and I think it was um, Natalie that was talking about it earlier. Is um, and Cynthia just talking about it whenever you have the opportunity. I mean, I've gone to, I've met people on campus, just on uh, walking across campus in hallways at lunch. I even uh, talked about it with uh, some poor faculty members at happy hour. I think they. They wanted to move to another table, but we were uh, we were excited about OERs and wanted to get their input on it. Another thing is to make sure that people work with the CTLs and the college libraries because uh, they they can add so much um, richness to the course and have such great experience in in trying to find those resources. 
So uh, how are we doing so far? We started in the summer with drafting the strategic plan, getting the team together, surveying folks, um, trying to get uh, the word out that what we wanted to accomplish. So we've hit some of our highest enrollment courses and we're in the middle of development for those. As I mentioned, we have an internal grant and I'm sure the question will be how much is that. It is the same, it's $2,500 a person for a max of $7,500 for the team. Um, and we try and get teams of two or three or maybe a little bit more. Uh, and that is equivalent to what an adjunct gets paid for teaching a three-hour class or a residential faculty would get paid for overload for a three-hour class. Um, we have in development those three courses you see on the left there in phase one. We are, have a call out for proposals right now. One of the things that I thought was really good that our executive sponsor mentioned that we should do is when we do proposals, send out a statement of interest first. So it's like a, a one minute uh, it takes to fill out the statement of interest that's just what course and who do you plan to work with. And then what we do is we take all those statements of interest. So we had 16 of them for this phase and we tried to connect like Una was saying as far as playing matchmaker. We try and play matchmaker and say work together to develop a proposal so that we can have a, a richer proposal and hopefully scale, uh, much more scalable while having people from different colleges. So that worked out well with our English 101 and 102. We got faculty from different colleges to get together based on our little matchmaking and now they're, they're working together to uh, develop those courses. So that's something I'd recommend as you uh, move forward on your projects is try and just gauge interest and then get people together. Uh, so we're also calculating our savings and the question always comes up, how are you doing it? And basically we, we used our uh, CCC OER consortium, asked folks how they were doing it. We investigated some ways to try and do it differently and it came out about the same and that's basically uh, if, if somebody's offering a class with free materials, you're saving them approximately $100 per student. So we found that to be pretty standard across and it seemed to match up with what we found as well. Uh, we also use $75 if they uh, have some nominal printed costs. If you ask for a, a printed textbook, usually it's around $20 to print at $25. Uh, we surveyed faculties. We ran uh, SIS's student information system. We're trying to get the word out not only for students, for them to be able to identify easily what courses have free materials, but also for us to be able to run reports. Um, so that we can more accurately and efficiently run those reports to determine savings. So here's a screenshot of our uh, website where you can find out more information and about the project. And we also have on the left side there each semester we're going to add up the savings. Our goal is to get to $5 million over five years. Uh, I know the state of Washington has already saved students I believe over $2 million. They're doing a great job and many of these other projects as we just heard about um, at Cerritos in Northern Virginia and, and many other places are doing some great work too. And it's really fun to go to uh, the Open Ed Conference and the last session at the last conference in November, everybody got up on stage, said how much they were saving and uh, it really totals up quickly and it's, it's very exciting to hear how much we're saving students. So with that, I think I will turn it back over. Um, by the way, this website is a, a continuous work in progress, so things continue to be updated and, and changed and hopefully making it easier to find materials. I think I'm back to Una. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, great presentations from all three of our presenters. And I just want to uh, make a shameless plug here for the Community College Consortium for OER. Um, there's my picture on the left and uh, there's my cohort, uh, James Lapper Grossclag, who is Dean at College of the Canyons and he's the president of our CCCOER advisory and we work with many of uh, you who are on today and we'd love to work with more of you on um, helping you to adopt OER in your classroom um, or working with your faculty on professional development and we offer a number of different options. Um, contact me if you if you want to talk about workshops or you want to provide input into uh, webinars that we have or um, if you'd like um, information on faculty and student surveys for OER. Um, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we have monthly webinars. Um, 
we had one in February on open textbook um, and adoptions, and we had um, open SUNY Speak and open Stacks. And, um, and Open Minnesota from the University of Minnesota, the Open Textbook Library folks. Um, all of our webinars are archived, <laughs> unless we have technical problems, um, but they are archived and generally up on YouTube and you can get those through our website. Um, and the, our February one was excellent. And obviously we're recording these as well uh, today on March 12th and uh, those will be available to you as well. And in April we're going to have a webinar on OER impact research findings. So uh, specifically to community colleges and, um, and, and librarians um, um, who are working in OER. And in May we have one on intellectual property specifically focusing on open licensing and open trademarks. And we uh, will probably have one in June too, but we're, uh, we're waiting for some more suggestions. We also have a monthly informal meeting uh, through our advisory. And if you'd like to join those advisory meetings as well as, well as these um, uh, webinars, uh, please contact me um, and I'll add you to our list. And at this point, um, I'm going to open this up for questions for our panelists. And I have put everybody's email here so that if for some reason we can't answer your question today, um, please go ahead and contact us over email and we'd be happy to do, to do so afterwards. So thank you very much, and um, on to questions. All right. So Sherry has a question here, um, which I'll uh, and uh, I, she was asking about the courses are developed and where do they get posted. And, and thank you, Cynthia, for answering that. Now Cynthia is talking about the Kaleidoscope um, courses, and they are posted um, in a, at the Lumen Learning website. And this is one thing, uh, Sherry, you asked an interesting question because Maricopa is posting their open courses um, at a location of their own uh, when they are completed. They're still in the process. Um, Washington State, who was on our webinar at 11 o'clock, uh, they, they post their open courses at the Open Course Library. And um, NOVA, of course, will be posting theirs um, in, at, their, um, at their site. Um, Natalie, do you want to speak at all about where you'll be posting um, your open courses? Right now, um, they are in Blackboard. And we are, I believe you can get Blackboard, what they call cartridges, which is basically um, like a compression of the course to share. Um, and we're working with the community college system. So uh, my director is the one, like I said, the administration has been very critical in organizing everything. So they're, they're the ones working on that. Um, but I can get a follow-up from Preston on that for you. OK, so if anyone wants to find out about the NOVA courses, contact Natalie. Oh, OK. And so Sherry asks another question. How do the people access the courses if they're not registered as students? Um, so I can start this question. So Sherry, these are actually, these are open educational resources. Uh, most of them um, are offered through the colleges themselves, so you have to register as a student. But the content of the courses um, is available as an open education resource, which means that you could take those resources and put them in your own learning management system or offer them through your own mechanism. Uh, these are not, but, um, for the most part, what we would call, um, they're not a MOOC. Uh, <laughs> sorry to use that word, but uh, they do require registration at the colleges, um, I guess with the exception of Kaleidoscope. So Cynthia, do you want to talk about the Lumen Learning courses? Um, and are those available to anyone, or, or, or do you need to come to the colleges? Um, they are available to anyone. Um, they are. Uh, Lumen Learning, like I said, is actually handling the courses. We put them in their Canvas system. But I believe when you, um, if you go to that link, it shows some of the courses. If you click on them, they're not, um, they, they, I think, just show a, a partial um, uh, of the course. But there is a link that says um, um, to contact them for more. Uh, information to request a common, here it is, to request a common cartridge version of a course, please send an email to, and it's support at lumenlearning.com. 
So thanks for that, Cynthia. So the idea is that you could take these courses and you could use them at your own yeah. college, but you wouldn't send right. your students to take the courses uh, that no. Cynthia developed for Cerritos College. Not unless you want to take my course, but then it's going to be specific, my specific st uh, student learning outcomes for Cerritos. Um, but if you went through Lumen Learning, they give you the cartridge and then you can uh, hopefully have no problems populating your course and then you go in and modify it to meet your college's uh, uh, student learning outcomes. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I want to, um, as we're waiting for any final questions, um, do any of our panelists want to make any final comments before we, um, before we close the webinar today? I'm in the process of uh, typing in some info about publicly available courses. So the content should be available, but probably not like the exams or quizzes. Um, certainly if there's a single version of it, they won't be. But um, there are there is a way within Canvas to just make it publicly available. It's a link. There's no login. And I'm going to include a link to a course one of our faculty wrote and made available. And it is a course on how to uh, create an OER course, an OER composition course. Oh, great. For English composition, right? Yeah, well, I, just, well, I just sent that one. Thank you. What's that? Uh, it was an English composition mm -hmm. course, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah, not music composition. Yeah. <laughs> just, just try to clarify. All right. Uh, Natalie, any final um, comments? No, if, if anybody has questions, please feel free to email me and I'll be happy to um, figure out the answer and get back to you. All right. Well, thank you so much to all of you for coming today and hearing about uh, these projects. Um, they were, um, I've heard them before and I'm inspired um, every time I hear about them again and I hear about the progress they've made since the last time I've been able to hear about them. So, Thank you so much, Paul, Natalie, and Cynthia. Uh, we really appreciate your time and um, hope to see you guys online and um, hope you'll join us for some more of our Community College Consortium activities. And I will now turn off the recorder.